Now let's talk a little bit about how science is practice. And in the real world, anything scientists do is observed. They pay attention to what they look at, and they, and they look at the details. They see the forest and the trees. And a good scientist sees things that other people look at but don't see. Let me give you an example that maybe you've read about, or, and if you haven't, you probably will, somewhere in your coursework, when, when, when you cover evolution. And that's this uh, experience that Darwin had when he went to the Galapagos Islands and studying the different animals and plants and so forth. And, and one of the things he noticed right off the bat was that there were different species of finches. Actually, it turns out he identified 13 species of finches. And they all differed in the kind of beak they had, you know, the bill. And the, uh, some, they had different shapes and sizes and in all of the bill, and uh, he not only noticed that, but he also noticed what they ate. You know, that's what birds do with their bill, they eat with it, right? So he paid attention to what they ate, and he noticed that they ate different things. You know, some, some of these finches ate nuts that they had to crack. Well, guess what kind of bill they had to have to do that? You know, big, strong, stout bill. Uh, Another, a couple other species ate insects, and their bill was shaped and de delicate and pointed and all to, to grab insects. Um, one finch even uh, was sort of like a woodpecker for pe pecking holes, and, and they, they'd get twigs to stick in the holes to fish out insects and what have you. And, and they had a bill that was designed that would really help them be effective at that. So, so Darwin saw the big picture. You know, he, he saw all these things that were related. And uh, the uh, and of course he thought about what that meant, and, and and that helped him come up with the idea of natural selection that there are situations in the environment that favor certain kinds of adaptations and. And the animals that happen to have that capability thrive. And, and those that don't, of course, don't survive and don't have offspring. Well, <clears throat> another thing scientists do is they think a lot. Uh, think all the time. I remember when I was uh, in high school, I, I had a girlfriend who said, Bill, you sure do think a lot. <laughs> I think her problem was I didn't think enough about her, but, <laughs> but she was right. You know, I was thinking all that time. If the, the best example and the best way to illustrate that I know of is, is to read some of Einstein's biographies, you know, where he, he told his life story. And by the way, Einstein was a pretty good writer, and he could speak in simple language. And, and you can tell from his writing that he was thinking all the time. When he was having coffee, when he was having breakfast, when, you know, whatever. He was always thinking about his research problem. Well, scientists not only think all the time, but they ask questions all the time. And they want to know, why, why are things that way? How does it work? How do I know that this is true? You know, always asking questions. And, and that's related to the fact that scientists are curious. You know, they don't just accept things at face value. They want to know more. And they, and they want to learn a lot. And, and if you ask me what's the one thing that characterizes science more than anything else, I would say curiosity. And if you don't have that, there's no way you're going to be a scientist. Now, another thing that uh, scientists do is that they uh, they 
come up with ideas to answer their own questions. If, if your teacher has talked to you about scientific method, you, you already know about the hypothesis. You know, the hypothesis is an informed guess uh, that answers a question you've raised. And, uh, and this is a necessary step in, in trying to uh, get your questions answered. And uh, part of that, of course, requires you to be creative in, in coming up with some kind of experimental design that will test your hypothesis to see if it's really true. Now, this business about asking questions and, and generating possible answers is uh, at the heart of what it takes to be a productive scientist. And, and scientists do this uh, naturally. It, it, they, they really don't have much choice. That's just the way they're built. I remember when I was a faculty member in uh, the biology department, and I was acting as department head, my, my dean, Mac Prescott, asked me uh, one day, uh, Clem, what can we do to get our professors to be more productive in research? And I thought about it for a while, and I said, not much. He said, what do you mean, not much? And, uh, and I said, I mean what I said. If you want people to be productive, you got to hire the kind of people who would do research if you made it illegal. Well, that wasn't the answer he wanted to hear, but... <laughs> and it is also true that there are things that can be done to remove some obstacles, you know, to get in the way of research. But if you don't have people who, who are driven to do research, there's not much you can do to get research out of it. Now, the next thing you have to do, of course, to be productive in science is design and perform tests, experiments. Designed to see if your hypothesis is correct or not. And associated with that, the methods you use have got to produce good data, data you can believe in, that you can trust. You, know, you got to make sure your instruments are calibrated and, and that you, and your, the data that you get are reliable. That's a big problem with science experiments you have to do in school because lots of times you're asked to draw conclusions and so forth and, and the data is pretty messy. You know, you, you, you don't, you, you haven't had enough experience in collecting this data to get good, reliable data. But, and it's really important, of course. So once you get data, you have to analyze it. Now in school, you're at the stage where they're teaching you how to interpret graphs. And, and tables and so forth, and think about the data to make sure uh, you know what the data say, and, and you have to think about how much variation there is in the data, and, and what's the best way to present the data, in graph or table form or whatever. And, and you also need to think about the, the magnitude of the effect. You know, you, you can get a, an effect of of your treatment that's put so small that it doesn't, it doesn't mean much, you know, it doesn't have much practical value. So all of these things have to be taken into account. After you do that, you have to make some kind of decision about your data. And in science, Decisions are based on the evidence, not what you hoped would happen or, or what you thought would happen, 
or what you wish would happen. <laughs> You've got to look at what did happen and draw your conclusions on the basis of that. You, your data may not have supported the hypothesis. That's okay. You get a better hypothesis. You know what's wrong. <laughs> That's a start. <laughs> you may not yet know what's right, but you, you've eliminated something that's wrong. And in any case, in almost all research, it, it leads, hopefully, to ideas of what to do next. You, you remember the student I told you about who was an all-age student who never generated any ideas? This is what you've got to do after you've finished your own project, is to think about the implications of your data. What, what, what does it mean? What's the significance of it? What can we do with that information and understanding? What should I do next in my next experiment? And, and this is where being creative comes in and, and generating ideas. So in, to sort of summarize all of this, let me say, let me say this. That science is a cyclic process. You start off and you make observations and you think about it. You ask questions, you design experiments, you collect data, and you evaluate the data, and you get new questions about you know, what to do next. And, 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 you, and this cycle repeats itself. There, there are several things that sometimes go wrong in, in thinking about research results, and, and I'm going to mention three of them, that these, these are errors that even good scientists make, and I've made them too, I have to admit. One, one common error is assuming that if two things go together, you know, happen at the same time, that one must have caused the other. That's not necessarily true at all. Let, let, let's, here's, here's a common example. Rain and lightning. They go together, right? Neither one causes the other. And scientists have to keep that in mind all the time. Because they, they fall into this trap of sometimes assuming that one thing is causing the other when something else is causing both of them. Another common problem is having blinders on and, and failure to think about alternatives. Al alternative hypotheses, alternative ways of thinking about the results and, and what they might mean. And the, the final common area error is trying to extend the results of your little experiment too far. You know, maybe other species or other kinds of situations where it may or may not apply. You may or may not get the same answer. Oh, one more thing we ought to talk about, and it, and it comes up in your classroom instruction all the time, is, is the, the, the difference between hypotheses and theories. Theories are a, a, a broader way of thinking about a, a science idea. The theories are, are, are very often not proved as well as a hypothesis can be. But theories have great value because they provide the framework within which you generate ideas to do experiments. And, and they're, you know, they help guide the direction of research. And the theory may be wrong, and if you do enough research that doesn't fit the theory, you better change the theory. Okay? But, but the theory is still important because that's the framework of what in, inside of which you do your thinking. And, and a good theory, of course, is, is very helpful, not only because it, it, it's a, it guides your thinking, but it ties a lot of isolated facts together. You know, helps helps make sense of it all. And, and this is the great value of Darwin's theory of evolution. He had all these independent observations, and only evolution put it all together. You know, it was uh, a unifying way of looking at, at how living organisms interact. And of course, a good theory stands the test of time. And, and uh, 
a lot of theories go down the drain. You know, some of them are just poor theories. But if they're good, they will last for decades and centuries. So to summarize everything we said, let me say this about uh, inquiry learning. In, 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 and try to remind us of, now what is it you learn when you do inquiry learning in science? What I think you learn is how to, first of all, uh, ask good questions. Good questions, you know, they're, they're meaningful as opposed to trivial. Uh, you also learn how to generate testable hypotheses. And hypotheses that's not testable isn't worth a whole lot. Because you can't verify it or falsify it. Inquiry learning also teaches you how to collect good data, data you can believe, you know, that's reliable, that other people can reproduce if they use your same methods. Another thing it does is it focuses on evidence. It, it makes you think about evidence and draw your beliefs and your conclusions and so forth in terms of what the real evidence is, not what you wish were so or so on. Inquiry learning also helps you develop insight, you know, get ideas. Be and I think it even helps you remember the science that you study because when you do all this thinking about it, that's, that's where memory rehearsal. So I'm all for inquiry learning and, and I hope that you get to enjoy it as you go through your school games. <laughs>